So where we left off in the last video, uh, Benjamin Franklin was born to a Puritan, he's a 10th son to a Puritan father in Boston, and he eventually ends up working for his brother as an apprentice at age 12, but then runs away at 17. Right, he runs away. He had written uh, the Silence Do Good essays. His brother had caught him uh, writing these essays under the pseudonym Silence Do Good. And Franklin didn't want to remain an apprentice, even though he was bound to do so. So he runs away in the nighttime. He gets on a boat in uh, Boston, sails uh, originally to New York, and after a few days decides to continue on to Philadelphia going up the, up the Philadelphia Bay, the Delaware Bay, and then into the river, and onto the Market Street Wharf of Philadelphia. And there's a famous scene of him He's arriving. 17 years old, 19 17 young, years young old, kid. bedraggled, wet. Uh, he has only a few coins in his pocket. When he arrives at the wharf, he gives one of the coins to the boatman as a tip. He says, you, you know, when you're really poor, you don't want people to know you're poor. So you pretend to be a little bit richer. And there it is, Franklin already caring about his public relations uh, and caring about just sort, of, just sort of being a typical American, sort of saying, I don't want to look like I'm poor. I'm going to be a generous guy. Uh, and him marching up Mar Market Street, with uh, he buys three puffy rolls, and he's all wet and bedraggled. Uh, he passes a doorway, and there's a 15-year-old girl named Deborah Reed, uh, and she sort of laughs at him, thinks he makes a ridiculous-looking figure. You know, we know this because years later, when he was 65 years old, he writes his autobiography, and there's the scene in it of him arriving in Philadelphia. And I think it's the best and certainly the most famous scene in autobiographical literature, which is Ben Franklin's arrival in Philadelphia. <laughs> and you see him discussing his arrival, and as you look at the manuscript of the autobiography, you see he writes in the fact that his wife, you know, who must have told him this later, said, hey, I was laughing at you and thought you made a ridiculous figure. And later on, Franklin writes in in the third draft that he's doing of the autobiography, as I certainly did. So he's being sort of self-aware and self-deprecating, but also very proud, because here he is saying, Rags to riches. I was in rags. I was bedraggled. My, even the person I ended up marrying was laughing at me. And then I became a great success. And, and pretty immediately he wants to marry her, but it doesn't work out Right. He well, decides obviously. to propose marriage to her. Her father was a tradesman, a, you know, a pretty successful merchant in Philadelphia. But Benjamin Franklin, first of all, he's 17, and he was truly a 17-year-old, <laughs> meaning he may have been very wise and could write very well, but he had a lot of adventures, let us say. And at one point, he has to go to England to get the uh, printing material, the typesets and the printing presses that he needs to become a printer. He wants to be a printer, but you obviously need equipment. Right. He didn't have equipment. He was working for somebody else who was a printer, and he wanted to start up a rival print shop. And somebody said, I'll stake you. I'll give you the money. You go to London and you buy the press. But the guy who was going to stake him ends up, uh, you know, pulling out or, you know, doesn't really stake him. And Franklin arrives in London with no money. So he works for almost two years in London to make enough money to buy the printing equipment. While he's over there, first of all, he's having a good time. He has many girlfriends and, you know, maybe writing a letter every now and then old, to his uh, young uh, friend Deborah back in Philadelphia. But she ends up getting married. She doesn't wait for him. And it's a real mess because she gets married. Franklin comes back from London. And then her husband disappears. So she's not really divorced, but she's not really, uh, you know, single and she's not really married, and so they eventually enter into a common-law marriage because they couldn't get married in the church because she was technically still married. And he, as I said, was having fun as a young you know, 20-year-old, and he had his own illegitimate child, a son named William. Uh, but unlike a lot of the uh, people of that period who had illegitimate children, he immediately took responsibility. He decides he's going to raise William himself, and so Deborah's not only willing to enter in the common law marriage, but also help raise his son, William Franklin. So this is pretty, uh, uh, especially for that period in time, I mean, on both sides, this, she, I guess, was officially married in the eyes of the church, mm -hmm. uh, but that's why they had to get a, a kind of a purely legal marriage. 
and then he has an illegitimate child right. returns and but but mm-hmm. they, you know it, and this is in this is in 1730 so he's still a fairly young man and she's even younger he's 24 she's like he's 22 at this point right right and uh, he you know it was a somewhat unconventional type of family and throughout his life he had that it's hard to know what to make of the relationship between Deborah Reed, mm-hmm. who never, as far as we can tell, and I've researched this a lot, never left Philadelphia, probably never spent the night more than four blocks from Market wow. Street, whereas you'll see from Franklin's life, he's in London, he's in Paris, he's in Boston, he goes up and down the coast of America during the postal system, and yet they have a very sort of friendly, even loving relationship, but not what we would call a normal, conventional marriage. Huh, fascinating. And so and this is, you know, he's starting to establish himself now. He's come, he comes mm-hmm. back, he, he's got some money saved up, he's got the equipment, mm-hmm. and this is when he really starts to establish himself as the, I guess, the Benjamin Franklin most people remember. Well, he becomes one of our first successful a uh, small business owner, just, and soon it becomes a big business. He has a print shop in Philadelphia. And if you have a print shop, you end up needing some content to print mm-hmm. in order to yeah. be good. So he starts a newspaper, which was the Pennsylvania Gazette. Unlike the other newspapers, there are a lot of other newspapers in this small town, maybe nine or ten of them, but one of them is affiliated with the Anglicans, another is affiliated with the Quakers, another with the proprietors, they were called, the Penn family, who owned most of the land, And Franklin decides to start an independent newspaper with a spunky, independent, very sort of freedom-loving American voice. Uh, And he writes with a lot of pseudonyms again in his newspaper, you know, writes stories under different people's, uh, you know, names, including Polly Baker, a woman he invents, uh, who tells the story of how she had had illegitimate children but raise them all. So he gets into sort of the politics of this. A little bit of social justice. Social justice a bit, but done with a real sense of humor (laughs) as Polly Baker is standing in front of the court saying, hey, I'm doing good for this colony. And by the way, some of you in the court are the reason I have these illegitimate (laughs) children. So it's a very funny fictional piece, but it's got a little social justice undercurrent. The other thing he does, because he wants a successful print shop, is he uh, needs something, you know, books to print. And he realizes that printing the Bible is not a really uh, smart idea because people buy the Bible just once in their life, maybe twice. Mm. He should print an almanac because people buy an almanac uh, every year. So in 1733, he starts what's called Poor Richard's Almanac. And just to take a step back here, I mean, I actually remember uh, almanacs, and I'm assuming they're still printed, but... I would guess some of the younger listeners to this will have no idea of what an almanac is. Imagine the World Wide Web, but in a pocketbook form. It came out every year. It told you the population of every city. It predicted the weather. It told you what the weather was like the year before. It gave you the horoscopes and the, where the moon phases and the sunrises would be. But it also had wonderful little lessons, told you how to remove stains from fabrics. <laughs> uh, when Tim Berners-Lee invites, invents the World Wide Web... He says he, because he remembered an almanac, an almanac of the same period as Ben Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac, that was called Inquire Within for everything. So the first name of the web was Inquire. It was a system <laughs> written to be an almanac but do it electronically. And, and why did he? Why isn't it not called mm. Ben Franklin's Almanac? It's well, Ben Poor Franklin Richard's. very often, as I said, wrote under a pseudonym. Sometimes he did it to disguise and be anonymous just like we invent pseudonyms yeah. when we're on you know, Twitter, maybe, or something. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, everybody knew who Poor Richard was. Right. Uh, it was sold at Ben Franklin's print shop. Everybody knew he was Poor Richard Saunders. But it gave him a way to poke fun, be humorous. Poor Richard Saunders even pokes fun at his printer, meaning pokes fun <laughs> at Ben Franklin, uh, saying he wants he has all these rattling traps, he needs to make money out of them, and so he's using me to make money that sort of thing. And we even get some of the famous old maxims because mm. Franklin liked to put in the margin of his almanac poor Richard's sayings. And you may remember some of them. You know, well, penny, penny saved. Penny saved is a penny earned. And early, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. And there were really about 150 of these over the years that become quite famous, some of which he adopted from other people's writings. But he just knew how to make them clever and pithy and becomes the most successful almanac ever printed in America. 
thousands and thousands of copies. So he ends up franchising other people in other cities to create print shops, to do Port of Richard's Almanac. And one of the coolest things he does as a media guy is he has the printing press, he has the content, he decides he needs a distribution system. So he helps create the American colonial postal system to tie together all of his print shops and to send the newspapers back and forth and to help the printing businesses of all of his friends and apprentices and relatives up and down the coast of the colonies be tied together. This is no small thing. You're saying he's constructing the postal system. The U.S. The US colonial <laughs> postal system is primarily brought together by Benjamin Franklin as a printer in Philadelphia in order to tie together the various uh, printing shops in the colonies that were usually run by his friends and relatives and to distribute the content like Poor Richard's Almanac. Fascinating.